So we gather and present our offerings. We give of who we are. We serve, and, and don't, <laughs> don't ever hear me saying the church doesn't need to be funded, that the missions that we support don't need to be funded. But we recognize that our offering is so much more than finances. Um, and whether you write a check or you drop some, some coins in a, in a collection box, uh, you do digitally, and whether you do it once a month, once a year, once a week, it's the attitude of our heart. And even if you say, well, I, I write a check or I have a bank draft that gets done once a month, and every Sunday he talks about the offering, well, I, I, I'm not giving that week. Well, hopefully you are. Hopefully you're giving of who you are. You're giving your natural talents and your spiritual gifts. You're, you're giving your mindset and your attitude. And I think it's important that we, we pause and do that. I know that when the pandemic started and we had to look at one of the things that we do um, uh, through Facebook online, that, are, are, that there were some who suggested, well, skip the offering. That can be done behind the scenes. But I think it's such a crucial part of our worship, not just the giving itself, but that commitment, that refocusing, that almost, um, almost a renewal of vows. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And this is why, even if you're not putting anything tangible in a physical offering plate as we worship, that we pause. And we dedicate ourselves to Him. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed us and gifted us. And now give us the grace to share that giftedness with others. To share our uniqueness. To fit a role that nobody else may be able to fit. As we seek together to serve you, to serve your kingdom. Share the name of Jesus that others may know the bounty we have received, the great gift of eternal life, and all the other blessings that come from you. We recognize that uh, as we sing around Thanksgiving time, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one. We can't count them all, but that doesn't mean we don't even try. And so, Father, we, we count our blessings and return a portion back to you. Commit our gifts commit ourselves in your name. It's in that name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning, uh, if you're using one of our hymnals, it's hymn number 480, uh, but it's also in the worship packet. Uh, if, you're, if you're hearing this and you're not getting that worship packet emailed to you, um, please contact the church office. Make sure that we get your email on there. Um, I had somebody just the other day stop in and say, you know, I'm not, I haven't been getting this. Um, we, we added them just uh, two weeks ago. Um, but our hymn, hymn number 480 from the hymnal in the worship packet, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Uh, certainly a good offertory uh, hymn. Let's sing it together.
to our pastoral prayer, our prayer for the flock. A reminder that it's not the pastoral prayer because the pastor has the microphone, but it's pastoral and that it's, it's that pasture setting, that flock setting, the care of the sheep. And we recognize that that's all of our care. We all share in that, of looking out for one another and following in the footsteps of the good shepherd. Uh, we look out for one another. And so we pray for one another. We pray for each other's uh, concerns, the burdens, the anxieties, the stresses, physical, mental, spiritual challenges. We pray for that as our care for one another. But just like we, we hear of the parable, the shepherd leaving the 99 to get the one, and then the, the rejoicing, the celebration, we celebrate together. When we hear what's going on in the lives of our fellow believers, of our church family, of, of the extended family, we celebrate and we offer praise. We recognize that praise serves the function not only of praising God, but being a testimony to others of what God has done. An encouragement that when I'm going through a hard time, perhaps I remember from a year ago when someone else was going through a similar circumstance, and two weeks later we were praising God in fellowship together. So we bring all of these things and we pray for and with one another. Now I know that you have a uh, prayer list at home. You know, maybe maybe you get uh, uh, you have a prayer journal that you keep and you write down and you date things and you write when prayers are answered. Maybe you have scraps of paper that you write things on. Um, maybe you, you uh, now with, with phones, I don't know how many alarms I have set on my phone, how many notes I have uh, typed in the notes section of my phone. Uh, however you choose to put together your prayers, we bring those together even now. I ask that you join me as we pray for one another. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done in the many ways that you continue to touch our lives. The opportunities we have to see you move on a daily, often moment by moment basis. We give you praise and glory. For the things that we have talked about even today, or the things that we've shared by email, or we've shared in a phone call, we've got a text message from someone. We lift concerns and we share our praise. We lift together um, those who have uh, suffered loss and those who have um, had funeral services to attend, whether in person or online, and we thank you for that technology that allows us to do so now. For those that are even now planning funeral services and trying to say, how do we sum up a life in just a brief memorial time together? For those who are even now sitting around the, the kitchen table lingering over breakfast, talking about the one who is missed from their presence, we pray encouragement, strength, comfort, and peace. For those undergoing medical treatments and physical therapies, for those who are still getting tests done to find out what in the world is going on, we offer prayers of encouragement and, and that the doctors, nurses, technicians, lab workers will be able to pool together their knowledge and their skill sets to come up with answers, to come up with things that move forward. Father, for those who are dealing with difficult economic times. Uh, those who are dealing with, with housing situations and the funding for, for medical procedures who are deferring treatments because they just can't afford it. Lord, we pray that a, a, a means will be made. That there will be a, a way to satisfy those things. And, and, and Father, we also pray for those on the other end of things who are being foolish with the, the funds that they do have, that aren't planning for rainy days, who are being frivolous. Lord, we, we, we pray judgment for them. We think of our young people uh, and those first jobs they get and trying to figure out how to save money and, and how, to, uh, how to tithe on that money and, and how to have money left before the next paycheck. Lord, we pray for those who've never learned that skill yet, that they continue on a path that gets them closer to those results. Father, for those who 
have delayed retirement because they just don't have the funds to do so comfortably. Lord, we, we pray that there will be a way that they not grind themselves down. And Father, for those who have retired too early and have find themselves in a malaise, Lord, may they find a way to engage, to find a way to be useful. Lord, we hear so often from folks who make one or two choices. Either they retire and stop, or they retire and get real busy. Lord, we pray that we are able to find a happy medium. Lord, for our young people, whether they're in college or if they're in, in schools, we know that education today is not what education was two years ago. We pray that the right accommodations be made, that the right systems be in place, that the right educational environment may produce good results. For it's certain that we know there are students that are always frustrated in the traditional setting to begin with, and what must their frustrations be like now? And for those who have to adapt to constantly changing technologies and demands and systems and, and environments, Lord, for those who are administrators and teachers and teachers' aides, we pray for patience and strength that they can move forward like the one who recently experienced an injury and is already back to teaching they may move forward for the sake of the learners that they impact. Lord, we know. We know that when we get into our adult lives, there's always that teacher that we look back on fondly. And sometimes there's that one that we wish we never had to endure. Lord, give our educators the grace to be those teachers we remember fondly. Lord, for these and so many more things, and, and we could spend innumerable hours, counting the ways that we've been blessed and counting the ways we need your help. For these things, we ask that you examine our hearts and minds, that in keeping with your will, that your will may be done in our lives and in the lives of your church. For these things we pray in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I was thinking of this idea of education and educational frustrations. Um, I was I was a challenge, I'm sure, for a lot of teachers that I had when I was growing up. Um, I'm sure that there were a lot of teachers that went home and told stories to their family about me. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why that, that could be, but, um, and I'm sure, I, I, I know, I know there were teachers too, because I got older, um, and hit those teen years where you have um, a lot going on as a teenager. Mixed emotions and emotions that come a lot closer to the surface than they perhaps normally would. That developing brain that really can't always make good sound decisions. I know that when I was a teenager, I gave teachers a hard time. Certainly. Other teachers, I just loved being in their classes and loved um, being with them. Uh, we, on Friday night on a family Zoom with my, my sisters, uh, my brother wasn't on, my folks were, uh, we got to talking about teachers and, hey, is there a teacher that today you would like to hang out with. And my oldest sister was like, I can't think of any teacher that I would want to, to be with. And, and that conversation started because my wife had been out at a restaurant and ran into a student of hers who's now um, a young adult um, and moved very near to where we live and invited her to come over to the house and hang out. Um, and that's how my, my sibling got, I can't imagine inviting any of my old teachers to come hang out at my house. Um, and I got to thinking of some that, yeah, I would. I would have enjoyed um, being with them. Um, and and uh, middle school and high school teachers, particularly, and then some, some college professors. Others that I would absolutely 
not want to hang out with and would want to avoid um, for all sorts of reasons. So just thinking about this idea of how, how those memories get made. What is it that would want me to hang out with the teacher? What would it, that they would want to hang out with me would might be a totally different question. And I, 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 I've been thinking about this idea of how much grief did I give Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so and how many times did they go home exhausted because of students like me. Well, that's also one of the reasons that I entered youth ministry. Because I know what kind of an idiot I was as a teenager. But there were adults in my life who poured into me anyway. Uh, last week I mentioned uh, Dave Baldack. Uh, Reverend Baldack was our minister of music uh, in my church during my teen years. Um, Reverend Tom Mayanashi was my youth pastor. Um, Harold Mears, my senior pastor during a lot of my formative years. Various Sunday school teachers. And how much they poured into idiot kids like me. I was recently home, well recently, uh, probably three years ago, it's in my home church, and actually I, I performed a baptism for my niece, and afterwards, a guy who had been one of my Sunday school teachers when I was in high school, um, a guy that every Sunday afternoon this time of year organized flag football, and we went to the um, community park, and uh, teenagers, and 20-somethings, and we just played flag football every Sunday. He organized these things, and his thing was it was a ministry. It was getting men and young men together to encourage one another, to spend time outside the church and say, you know, you don't have to put on one face in church and another when you're playing flag football. He greeted me in the front of the church after um, the baptism time, and he said, you know what? I always knew that you could do these kind of things. And there were times that you drove me nuts. He said, I'm going to share a particular one. And he and, his, he and his wife were co-teachers in my class. And he said, um, we were ending Sunday school for the summer. And I told students, I want you to pray for one specific thing. That when we come back in the fall, you're going to give me... Did you get an answer to that prayer? He said, we came back in the fall and we were going around the classroom and people were sharing what their, that one thing they specifically concentrated on, they prayed for, and how they got an answer. He said, and we came to you. And he gave me this look. And, and man, it just reminded me of what, what a punk I was. He said, we got to you. And you said, I prayed and my prayer wasn't answered. He said, I was kind of taken aback because everybody else said, I was praying and this is how God answered me. And he said, what was the prayer? And apparently this was my teenage response. It is not my 50-something response, but it was my teenage response. Apparently my prayer had been, and I said this to he and his wife, was that you wouldn't be our Sunday school teachers this year, but God didn't answer thing to say. And he continued to pour into the lives of young people. We probably went that afternoon and played football at Simmons Park. And he did not hold that against me, but apparently he's held on to that for 40 years. He remembered that. Hopefully, the sting not so much now as it was then. you ever been like that? Have you ever had a bit of an attitude that you really have no reason to have? Have you ever been, and maybe you can remember, perhaps it was those teenage years or, or a young life or a midlife crisis where your brain just wasn't functioning the way it should? 
The decisions that you were making weren't necessarily good decisions. Perhaps you were kind of getting down on yourself. You were questioning your life choices. You were questioning your, your uh, collegiate path, your career path, your social connections, your relationships. And maybe you can look back and say, I wasn't always making good decisions, and I wasn't always coming from a positive place. I want to share with you a, a bit of a, a song um, called Fooling Yourself. That's today's sermon title, Fooling Yourself. Uh, this is a song that was in the, in the 70s uh, by a group called Styx, S-T-Y-X. I don't know how many of you remember those, a favorite of my wife's. Um, and they had an album in 1977 called The Grand Illusion. And from that album, they put out a single. Um, and it, it didn't do great. Uh, it, it charted, it made it number 29 on Billboard's Hot 100. Uh, and it was written by the guitarist. The guitarist was Tommy Shaw. And he wrote this um, really about the, the keyboardist, Dennis DeYoung, um, who as the band was just coming, I believe this was their second album, and the band was dealing with that whole success, and how do you go from not success to success, and the challenges of taking the stresses, and you think everything's going to be great, but there's some setbacks, and Tommy Shaw looked at Dennis the Young as this angry young man who feels every setback deeply and personally, and questions any positive. And now, maybe there's been somebody like that in your life. If it wasn't you, maybe it was you know, your son or your sister growing up or somebody that you went to school with that just had this chip on their shoulder and nothing was ever going to go right for them. And frankly, I can kind of remember some of those days where it didn't seem like no matter what I did, I would ever be good enough, that I would ever be popular, that I'd ever be successful, that I'd ever be academically inclined. And so you do some of those things that self-sabotage, so that then you say, well, I was never trying to be. Um, you look at some of the kids today and the way they dress, and they dress to get your attention, they style themselves to get your attention, and then they look at you like, why are you looking at me? Uh, well, maybe you understand that. So, Tommy Shaw wrote this song called Fooling Yourself. And like a lot of song titles, there's that parenthetical in the title. Fooling Yourself, but it's also known as The Angry Young Man. As a matter of fact, a lot of people think that's the title of the song. Because that's the line they, they pick up on. But it's called Fooling Yourself. And here's the words of it. You see the world through your cynical eyes. You're a troubled young man, I can tell. You've got it all in the palm of your hand, but your hands wet with sweat and your head needs a rest. And you're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. You're kidding yourself if you don't believe it. Why must you be such an angry young man when your future looks quite bright to me? How can there be such a sinister plan that could hide such a lamb, such a caring young man? And in the chorus, you're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. You're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. Get up. Get back on your feet. You're the one they can't beat, and you know it. Come on, let's see what you've got. Just take your best shot and don't blow it. You're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. It goes on through that chorus again. And I don't know that every young person that heard that saw themselves in that song. I don't know how many, when they heard it for the first time, said, hey, he's singing about me. I'm that angry young man who gets knocked down and thinks there's no getting up again. And maybe they need to hear Tommy Shaw and, and Sticks singing, you're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. You can do this. And I know there's some of you right now saying, I thought we might get a sermon today, or a message. Why are we hearing about Chaz being an idiot teenager? Why are we hearing about an angry young man fooling yourself? Well, because I think 
that that's a universal theme. And I think we see it even in our scripture text. If you go to Mark chapter 9, oh, and I have to insert here. Last week, I apologize for any confusion for folks. In the order of service, we listed the reference correctly as Mark chapter 9 in the um, printout in the worship packet where I put out the information. I labeled it as John, and somehow when we posted it on Facebook, it was listed as Luke chapter 9. It was actually Mark chapter 9. Some of you were able to, to, to catch up on that. I was oblivious to it until somebody pointed it out to me. Mark chapter 9. We're going to really begin at verse 38 and read through verse 50. Again, if you have the um, worship packet, uh, it, it's included in there. Um, you can use your translation. You can use a Bible app and read from different trying to compare translations if you'd like. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 38. And that said, I want to back up to verse 37. Verse 36 and 37, where we left off last week. We left off with... He took a little child whom he placed among them, taking the child in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And that's where we ended off. I think we had some good discussion there. Verse 38 picks up and there's this kind of disconnect. There's this kind of pivot that, of, of wait, where, how do we end up there? Verse 38 Leading out of that little child and welcoming this little one. 38 says, Teacher, said John. And there is some John the beloved. John the one that's so close to Jesus. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Now, man, that just seems to me so much like an angry young man. Here, Jesus, teacher, rabbi, master, is talking about welcoming the little child. Welcoming like that, and in doing so, welcoming God. And John, this beloved disciple, this, this young man with so much potential, is thinking back to, you know, we saw something driving out demons, and we, made, we told him to stop. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, isn't that how sometimes your mind does? You hear one thing and you're totally off on another page. You're thinking about what your problem is. The thing that's been bothering you. Do you do that sometimes? You have something that happens at work. You have something that happens um, in the neighborhood. Something that happens in the family. And the next day somebody's talking to you and you're still in the back of your mind mauling that over. Saying, why, why, why would they say that to me? Who do they think they are that they could? And you kind of blurt that out in the middle of the conversation. Well, why might John have been thinking about this? And if you're using your worship packet, I've included this here in some smaller print. If actually we go back up in Mark chapter 9, some verses we didn't read as we went through here. Um, and if you're using your Bible, Mark chapter 9, verse uh, 17. In an earlier episode, a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, and throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why, why couldn't we drive it out? So, I think that John still has in his mind the failure that he perceives of not being able to drive out that demon. And he's one of Jesus' inner circle. He's one of the twelve. He's one of the top three. He's arguably number one in relationship to Jesus. And why couldn't we drive out that demon? And now... Hey, Jesus, by the way, we saw somebody else driving out demons, and we told him something because he's not one of us. How can somebody who's not one of us be driving out demons? That's not fair. If anybody should do it, it should be us. You can go back and see how Jesus talked about that demon. You can do that later, not now. 
So John tells him, we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Jesus gives him this reply, do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can be in the next moment, can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And you certainly have heard that before, haven't you? Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus is trying to talk to that, that muddled up brain that is hung up on the fact of, why can they do something I couldn't do? Am I a failure? What, 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 what's the internal conversation going on among the disciples? And they're trying to stop somebody who's doing the right thing. Don't stop them. Just because they're not part of us doesn't mean they're not with us. Now, it really doesn't... I, there's nothing here that says who that guy was. We saw someone driving out demons who was not one of us. Was he one of the larger group of disciples? Was he one of the, the disciples that went out two by two earlier? But maybe not one of the twelve? Maybe, maybe he was a, somebody who they ministered to, they witnessed to, that Jesus kind of filled their life, and they were kind of independently out of response doing this. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe it was one of John the Baptist's disciples. It was one of the, those kind of on the fringe of being one of Jesus' disciples as well. But wasn't part of the inner group. Maybe never actually joined, never got his membership card, but he's still doing this in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, don't stop him. He's still part of us. He's doing things in my name. That's a good thing. Sometimes in church, we kind of get like that angry young man. And we don't like because that other church down the street, they're doing things different. They're filling their sanctuary and they're rubbing elbows with people. They're not making people wear masks. They're not social distancing. That church down there, you know what they're doing? They're not even meeting in their building. They're not meeting at all. They're, they're only online. Their pastor records everything and they, they see it down the road. That church over there, you know what? They're pouring all this money into building a gymnasium when they should be pouring it into building a food bank. And that church down there, they have a food bank, but they don't do it right. They give out the, the, the food on, on the wrong days. They make you go to a Bible study class before you get the food, or that one doesn't make you even sign up. They don't even take your name. They just give away the food. That's poor stewardship. We can find fault with what everybody else is doing, and we need to tell them to stop because they're not doing it right. You know, they're, they're not doing communion right. They're excluding people from communion, or they're doing communion every time they have a service, or they're only doing communion once a year. They're doing it with wine. They're doing it with grape juice. We can find a reason to say, they're not one of us. We want them to stop. And Jesus wants us to hear, stop being such an angry young man. Stop focusing on the differences and remember that they're doing it in my name. Within the church, there might be different ministries. Within ministries, there might be different emphasis. Within ministries, there might be different workers who do things differently. And we have to be careful not to expect everybody to do things the way we do. There's a reason God gifted us each uniquely and differently to meet His purposes. One of my sisters, and I'm not going to say her name, but she's the one that's really pushing 70 right now. Not the one that turned 70, but the one who's getting there in a few months. She still volunteers in junior high ministry. How many 69-year-old folks can you think of that still volunteer in junior high ministry? Goes to lock-ins, goes to overnights, goes to work camps with these young people. She's a volunteer. It's not her profession. She wasn't trained in this. 
but she connects to people. She connects to sometimes those students, that the youth pastor, and the other staff members, and the other young, hip, cool youth leaders just can't connect to. She doesn't have to be like that. She doesn't have to be able to play guitar or the drums. She doesn't have to sing, and if you heard her sing, you know she probably shouldn't sing. Um, we're like that in many ways. But she gets it and connects with kids that otherwise would be missed. Kids that otherwise would be sitting in the corner, angry young men, typically angry young girls who she really connects with young girls. And she encourages them. She doesn't focus on their negative, but focuses on what they could do. Like that Sunday school teacher that I had, that I told him I prayed that he wouldn't be my teacher anymore, and continued to pour into me. She continues to pour into me. And I would bet that if you were trying to write up the description of a successful youth ministry volunteer, it would not be my sister. But I guarantee that she is successful in what she does. And why every time she tries to tell the youth minister, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm getting too old for this, I'm done, he tells her, no, we need you. I think mean, Jesus wanted John and his disciples to hear this message. That we need those folks, even if they're not like you. Even if they're not part of the inner group. We need folks who are out there driving out demons, and it might make you mad because you couldn't do it. Well, let me tell you, I'm sure that my sister reaches young people that this highly trained, highly experienced, well-paid youth minister cannot reach. And I think it does fit in with this idea of welcome the child unto me. You might not see the value, but I do. I see the value of that volunteer in youth ministry. I see the value of that one casting out demons even if he doesn't do everything that we do, even if they use a different translation of the Bible, even if they worship on a different day or, oh my goodness, they worship on Saturday night, they are part of us. He says, truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Even the smallest thing, let's face it, a cup of water is about the least you can offer to someone. When you want to be hospitable, that's about the least you could possibly do. And Jesus says, even that counts. And there's no qualifications on who that person is. It doesn't say, well, they have to have gone through my new members class, or they have to have gone through a seminary course, or they have to have um, served on a committee first. If they do it in my name, it counts. So angry young man, you're fooling yourself if you think you have nothing that you can give. If you have nothing that you can do for the sake of the kingdom, if you have nothing that you can do to make a difference in someone's life, because you're comparing yourself to that person who's the great athlete, and that person who's the great scholar, and that person who, who's funny and popular. You've got something that you can give, and it counts. And not everybody's going to be doing the same thing. Somebody's going to be driving out a demon. Somebody's going to be offering a cup of cold water. Peter's going to be up there hogging the microphone. And Andrew's going to be in the back working the room and getting to know that person who feels ostracized and isn't sure why they can't came. And is thinking maybe they could sneak out the back door. Andrew's going to catch them. Don't stop Verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, see Jesus brings it back in, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Boy, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? And I don't think he's just talking about little children, like the child that he welcomed in earlier, that he put his arms around. Mark's the only gospel that says he put his arms around and embraced the child. 
Anyone who causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, those who might be immature in faith, those who might not be up to doing grand miracles, but are willing to offer a cup of water, who are willing to offer a couple of loaves of bread and a few fish. If you cause them to stumble, it would be better if you have a large millstone around your neck and thrown in the sea, into the sea. If your squabble in church causes somebody to leave church, no matter how theologically right you were, you're in trouble. I think he's putting John on blast here a little bit. If there's somebody out there doing ministry in my name, and you tell them to stop because it's not how you do ministry, or it's a place where you've had failure, and you tell them to stop, and they move away from doing ministry, you should have a millstone around your neck and thrown into the sea. Boy, does that point back home, doesn't it? How many things have we done that have discouraged instead of encouraged somebody else? Maybe somebody who was doing a lot of good things, but we had to correct them on things. Maybe somebody who said, you know what? My gift is music, and I play heavy metal music, and I'm going to be in a heavy metal Jesus band. And you want to tell them, well, that music's up the devil. If they're offering a cup of cold water, if they're casting demons in the name of Jesus, the people are coming to Christ because that's the only music I've ever listened to that spoke to me. And you tell them to stop playing. How dare you? John, Jesus did not make you the decider of who can do things for Jesus. And he didn't make me that decider. He didn't make Scotch Plains Baptist Church that desire. And if the things that are causing, that we do, that cause somebody else grief, that cause somebody else to step away from their faith, that cause somebody else to say, you know what, it wasn't worth it, I tried, I'm done, I'm walking away, I wasn't good enough, I failed, I knew I couldn't do it. then we're in trouble. Verse 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with, with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. You think Jesus is serious about this? Three different times he gave examples of change the behavior that's causing you to mess up. It's better to change that than to end up in hell. Verse 49, everyone will be salted with fire. Really strange thing. We're not going to do a deep dive into that, but a strange thing. Salted, obviously, seasoned. Oh, um, sometimes uh, purified with salt. Um, made more wholesome. Maybe disguised the unwholesomeness. But everyone will be seasoned or will be salted with fire. And it's not the fire of hell, but the fire of refinement. It will be challenging. It will be difficult. But everyone's going to need it. And so John and disciples who couldn't cast out a demon, maybe you need a little bit more fire. You need, you need to feel that. You need to have something change. Those of you that are judging how other people are doing things in the faith because they don't do the way you do, Maybe you need some refining. You need a little bit of fire. You need to feel a little, little something to change that attitude. And I wonder how, when, when, when this comes up, it, Jesus wants to say, hey, remember those Pharisees that were getting upset because some of you were eating without ceremonially washing your hands and they, they were on your case about it? 
And now you're going to get on that guy's case for casting out, for casting out demons? Because he's not in the right club? Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Salt among yourselves. See, we often hear that, you know, you're the salt of the world, and then again, about the, it loses its saltiness. And we think about, we, we're salt out there, we forget to season in here. Literally within the local church, but also within the broader church, within the church of those who are called out in the name of Jesus, who are doing ministry in his name. Have a little salt. Have a little preservative, a little flavoring. Have a little fire. Have a little refinement. Have a little removing of extra stuff. And let's not get so concerned over how they do baptism. Or who they marry. Because if we wait until we get everybody that thinks exactly like we do, I would be in church by myself, and there are some days I could not be with myself. Have a little salt. If they're offering a cup of water, if they're casting out demons, if they're doing it in my name, they are part of the family. And if you're doing something to keep them from being part of the family, Man, you're in trouble. And if there's something in your attitude that's causing that, cut that out of your attitude. If it's a preconceived notion of this is what it means to be a Christian, you can't dance, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do, cut out that attitude. It would be better to leave that attitude behind and work for the good of the church than to cause someone to fall away from it. To be the thing that trips somebody else, that causes somebody else to stumble. You see the world through your cynical eyes. You're a troubled young man, I can tell. You've got it all in the palm of your hand, but your hands wet with sweat and your head needs a rest. You're fooling yourself if you don't believe it. You're kidding yourself if you don't believe it. Why must you be such an angry young man when your future looks quite bright to me? How can there be such a sinister plan that would hide such a lamb, such a caring young man? Be who God planned for you to be. And let go of the rest. Even if, even if the best you can do today is offer up a cup of cold water, you're doing what God wants you to do. Don't let anybody stop you. Let's pray here. Holy God. Thank you for this day, the opportunity to gather, to read your word, to sing, to offer our gifts, to pray together, to listen with our spirit to what your spirit would speak to us. Allow us to hear the message that you plan for each one of us individually. Allow us to not only listen, not only to hear, but to put into action and to leave this place changed by you. Step forward. And do what we do, not to be judged by others, but in the name of Jesus. It's that in which we pray. Amen. Our part in hymn, hymn number 779, if you're using our hymnal, it's in your worship packet. It's entitled, We Are Called to Be God's People. A little heads up, it's a two-pager. Um, so I, I don't remember how the worship packet stapled together. If you have to flip a page or not, I think it's, you can open the both pages at the same time. We are called to be God's people. Let's sing together.